This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Thank you for uh, attending this morning. Some of you will already be, I see many familiar faces here, but I see people that I haven't uh, worked with before. So you will already be aware of the fact that I have a very distinct speech impediment uh, for which I ordinarily require uh, the services of an interpreter. But at this, this early stage in the morning, uh, someone who speaks fluent Glaswegian is actually quite difficult uh, to lay one's hands on. So I want to begin with a quotation from, I think, one of the best ethicists in the United States currently, and also himself a physician, Dr. Daniel Sulmesi. And with respect to the, the, the topic that we are focusing on this morning, futility, he had this to say. The notion of medical futility is a lightning rod attracting all the static in an atmosphere charged with rising patient expectations, rocketing healthcare costs, and, and this is important for this morning's talk, and attacks on professional judgment. So having said that, to uh, prefix my talk this morning, let me identify my objectives hopefully all of which I will be able to um, talk something about. The first is to explain what is generally meant by the expression futile treatment. Secondly, to analyse the nature of the ethical conflict surrounding medical futility, with specific reference to claims based on patient or, in the paediatric setting, parental autonomy. Thirdly, to identify and to justify the relevant professional norms that ground what I want to suggest is a duty to limit futile treatment. And then finally, to explore practical mechanisms to prevent and or to manage conflict regarding futile treatment. Now, there is a pretty substantial body of uh, data out there, of empirical data, about futile treatment, not actually quite so much in the paediatric population as there is in the adult population, but it is not my intention to focus on that. I want to focus more on the theory, uh, more, if you will, on the theology, the philosophy behind the, the issue of futile treatment. So let's focus, let's try and explain in the most basic terms what we are discussing when we discuss the topic of medical futility. What are ethicists referring to when they talk about futility? Uh, as succinctly as possible, we are talking about conflict between physicians and other healthcare providers, nurses for instance, but primarily physicians. Conflict between them and patients, or in the paediatric setting more probably parents, regarding the provision of life-sustaining treatment, or rather, the non-provision of life-sustaining treatment, because the physician has determined that they believe the treatment is or is likely to be futile, that is, non-beneficial or harmful. So if we were zooming in a little bit and wanted to concretize the ethical questions, that the issue of futility raises, I would suggest we can, we can essentially distill those into two questions. The first is whether a physician has the moral right, but more importantly, I would suggest whether a physician has the moral duty to refuse to provide certain types of treatment, primarily because they believe the treatment is futile, or whether the patient paediatric setting, the parent has themselves the moral and perhaps even the legal right to insist 
that treatment be provided, and that a physician has a corresponding duty to provide that treatment, even although he or she believes the treatment is futile. So let me begin by suggesting certain definitions. I hope it isn't heresy here in the United States to quote um, from the Oxford English Dictionary, but I'm going to do that. When defining futile, the O-E-D says that the word means one, either incapable of producing any results, useless, ineffectual, vain, and then secondarily, that it means that which is lacking in purpose. So that's a general definition of the word futility. Let's look at uh, some standard definitions of the, the, co the concept futile treatment. And I, want, I would actually suggest that those of you who are interested in this topic and working here in a hospital who could not be interested in this topic, I would suggest that you consider buying and reading what I think is probably the best book on this subject called Wrong Medicine, which was written jointly by Schneiderman and Jekyll. And they provide the following definition of futility. Namely, <clears throat> any effort to provide a benefit to a patient that is highly likely to fail and whose rare exceptions cannot be systematically reproduced. Such an effort may appropriately be termed a futile treatment, a futile effort. Our own hospital has a definition also, and you will find this definition in a policy with which I would suggest you all become familiar. The policy is Hospital Policy 1319 on withdrawing and withholding medically inappropriate treatment. There, uh, futile treatment is defined as follows or rather, as we prefer to, to call it in our hospital, medically inappropriate treatment. A medically inappropriate treatment is one that lacks a reasonable expectation of securing a proper goal of medicine. So what I would like you to note from both of those definitions, both from Schneiderman and from 1319, is that these definitions generally contain two distinct but related components. So there are two aspects conceptually to that which we call futile treatment. There is a quantitative component, essentially a physiologic component, which looks at the likelihood, the probability, if you will, of producing an effect the physiological effect, that is, the, 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 general, um, the, the general effect of the particular intervention we provide. But in addition to that quantitative component, there is always necessarily, and perhaps more importantly, a qualitative or an evaluative component. Namely, and this is extremely important, whether the physiological effect can itself be equated with being beneficial to the patient, assuming that there is a high likelihood that the ventilator will actually perpetuate pulmonary function or respiratory function. Nevertheless, in this patient, is the perpetuation of that function actually beneficial to them as a human being? So there are these two components, the quantitative and the qualitative so let me look first of all at the quantitative aspect of futility. A treatment is quantitatively futile, where in all probability the intended physiological effect, whether it be a benefit or not, cannot or will not be achieved. Namely, if we were to put this in ordinary language, a treatment is futile if it will not work or we have reason to believe that it will not work. The most literal meaning of futility uh, is encompassed by this conceptualization. Some have suggested, in fact, that we should reserve the use of the term futile to this situation exclusively and use other nomenclature when it comes to the qualitative aspects of um, a futility judgment. In fact, the, the, the names that have been suggested 
the, the, as alternatives to the use of the word futile for that other set of, of, of cases. And perhaps even in general, because the word futile comes actually with quite negative baggage, uh, the alternatives that have been suggested are as follows. The first is that we should talk about ineffective treatment. The second, that we should probably talk about non-beneficial treatment, treatment that it is not, or that does not have the likelihood of conferring a benefit of being toward the patient's well-being. Thirdly, that actually more accurately, what we are looking at when we are in the midst of a futile situation is actually harmful treatment. It is treatment which actually violates the most basic of all the moral maxims in medicine. It is harming, hurting, destroying the patient. And then, perhaps a more neutral, but in some regards a philosophically more pleasing uh, form of nomenclature, and the nomenclature we have here at UCLA, instead of talking about futile treatment, we should talk about medically inappropriate treatment, which causes us to reflect on the nature of medicine itself. And I will be talking about the nature of medicine, the ontology, if you will, of medicine, the goals of medicine later. But going back to uh, this idea of quantitative futility, there are certain problems that people have raised with this idea. Uh, the first question that has been asked is, is it necessary in order to term an intervention quantitatively futile, to be absolutely certain that the intervention will not achieve its intended physiological purpose? Well, the answer to that is actually relatively simple. No, it isn't necessary to demonstrate with certainty the quantitative futility of an intervention because absolute certainty of inefficacy is quite simply impossible. A doctor can never definitively say with absolute certainty that an otherwise indicated treatment will absolutely not work in this patient. But, and I think this is extremely important, and I will, I will come back to this later when I, I discuss how doctors ought to talk, absolute certainty is not and should never be the basis upon which medical decisions are made. Medicine is not a science of the certain. Medicine is the art of the probable. It is sufficient, as I suggest here, to establish quantitative futility, that the treatment be, what I would say as a, a lawyer, reasonably certain to fail, which is to say that it is likely to fail with a high degree of probability. Of course, that still begs the question, how improbable is too improbable when, when we are assessing the futility of, a, of an intervention quantitatively? It has also been argued by some that the burden of proof to justify treatment in certain circumstances actually should be reversed. Instead of treatment being the default position, unless it is highly likely that the treatment will fail, non-treatment should be the default position, unless treatment is highly likely to succeed. Now, that clearly wouldn't be, the, wouldn't be our, our ordinary default position, but it has been suggested that it should be our default position, one, when the treatments are attended with a high degree of risk or burden, and that this is especially the case when the requested treatment comes from a person other than the patient themselves. In other words, when someone else is requesting burdensome treatment to be imposed on or inflicted on another. What I'd like to turn to now, however, is that the main topic for my, my discussion this morning, which is actually qualitative futility. Futility has a qualitative dimension. Physiological efficacy 
alone, the fact that the ventilator will keep someone's lungs going, does not necessarily render a treatment medically appropriate. A treatment which, although technically successful, will not benefit, or which will not benefit a patient, is also medically inappropriate and can be judged futile in that broader sense of the term. So the distinction which is being made here is the distinction between an effect, a bare effect, which we can uh, characterise as a physiological change to organ systems, being contrasted with a benefit, which is to say the enhancement of an individual human being's experience of being a person. And that actually is essentially what medicine is for. It is the yardstick against which you as physicians and healthcare providers should evaluate what you're doing, whether or not, hand on heart, what is being done is enhancing an individual human being's experience of being a person amongst other people, including ourselves. The overarching goal of medicine, it should need to be said, but it does need to be said, the overarching goal of medicine is to benefit suffering human beings. But of course, just as there were issues with quantitative futility, there are difficult issues with respect to qualitative futility. What counts as a benefit? Who should make that decision? And upon what basis? What benefits are appropriate for a physician, specifically as a physician, in terms of the, the richness and the authenticity of, of that title? What benefits is it appropriate for a physician to leave this auditorium this morning, to go upstairs and to pursue? What are the ancient and the noble goals of medicine? Then, to be more specific, is continued existence in and of itself a benefit to a patient? Is attempting to achieve that an authentic goal of medicine? And then something we do have to ask ourselves, particularly in our hospital, because of the extraordinarily sick individuals we treat and because of the type of technology we have at our disposal, are there certain states of, let's say in parenthesis, health, are there certain states of health that it is wrong for a physician to create or to perpetuate? And I think it is important that we do accept that in a certain sense, because of our technology, many of the health states we see are at least permissively, insofar as we perpetuate them, they are iatrogenic. Um, and if there are such states, which states are they? And why ought we not to presumably unintentionally create them, or more accurately, to perpetuate them? And then there is the question about the extent to which medicine physicians are actually talking to each other as a global profession, or at least as a national profession. Much more easy in a small country like Scotland or the United Kingdom, much more difficult in a, a, a massive country like the United States. But do physicians, have they reflected together sufficiently if not, to have a, if not to have unanimity on what states are inappropriate to perpetuate, at least to have a broad consensus. Uh, a cursory look at the literature will tell you that actually there would appear not to be a terribly robust consensus, despite the fact that we have been discussing this issue now for decades, which I think is unfortunate. Um, 
this was a checklist I had simply for the, uh, the medical students and the residents, uh, questions simply to ask themselves when deciding whether or not one actually should offer a treatment. Uh, it's extremely simple, but notwithstanding its simplicity, I think it's a question that always has to be asked. Before one provides a treatment, one must ask, one, is there a reasonable chance, two, of a good outcome? And in paediatrics, several, um, several of the fellows I, I teach in the core curriculum have asked me, what, what do you mean by a good outcome? And, and one can be extremely technical and philosophical in giving an answer to that question. But I think there is a very simple answer to the question of what equates with a good outcome in paediatrics. It is a happy child. Perhaps not immediately, but there has to be the realistic expectation that a, as a result of what we do, as a result of what we inflict on them, there is the reasonable chance that they get to live as a happy child. So I want to turn from that, that discussion there of the, essentially, of what we mean by futility and what we mean by um, futile treatment to looking at the ethics of futility. And here's a quote from who I happen to think is probably the greatest medical ethicist uh, who I happen to think has lived. He, he, was a, he was a physician out of Georgetown, but he was also a great, um, I happen to think he was a, a great philosopher. One of the, the quotes I love most of all and I use all the time with medical students comes from that, that extraordinary physician, uh, Galen, the, the, the physician for the Emperor Marcus Aurelius, the great Stoic, um, who said, and I think very, very rarely have truer words ever been spoken in medicine, the best physician is also and necessarily a philosopher. Uh, now, of course, Galen would say that because he was a physician and a philosopher, uh, but uh, Pellegrino encapsulates this, this um, it seems to me, that this ideal. And he said, and I, I think it is very, very true, and we should bear it in our minds when we leave here to go to the units. Whenever medicine, whenever medicine is used for any purpose or goal that distorts, frustrates, or impairs its capacity to achieve its proper ends, it loses its integrity as a craft and its moral status as a human activity. So bearing that in mind, let's look at what actually is, what is the ethical conflict that's going on in futility situations, in these conflicts between physicians on the one hand and patients or in paediatrics parents on the other. So the last half century has seen the rise of respect for patient autonomy as a cardinal principle of medical ethics, replacing the old, although for me it's not old, the old Hippocratic um, idea of beneficence that essentially the ethics of medicine consists in the doctor knowing and doing what is good for patients. If we want some definitions here, autonomy is the capacity and the moral right of an individual to choose and follow their own plan of life. And then the corresponding moral obligation, the, the obligation of respect for autonomy, is the moral attitude that inclines a person, yourselves as physicians or nurses, to refrain from interference with another person's life, beliefs, choices, and actions, and positively to attempt to enhance an individual's ability to choose freely and to achieve their goals. Now, the idea of autonomy, I would accept, in paediatrics is problematic for very obvious reasons. Many of your patients are not capable by reason of their age and never have been capable, we think, of our neonates. Others are only partially capable. They are individuals growing into their autonomy but who have not attained the fullness thereof. And then we have other patients 
who although they are as a matter of fact fully capable, minors, but mature sufficiently in their judgment to be capable of autonomous decision-making, but who as a matter of law may not make their own decisions because that power is lawfully invested in their parents because the child has failed yet to attain the age of majority. So from the patient perspective, the concept of autonomy, which I think is central to futility concerns, is problematic. Parental autonomy, the autonomy of the parent as surrogate, is also problematic because parents, in fact, as hopefully you well know, and we should remember this, because parents do not have unfettered freedom with respect to the decisions they make about their children. Parents must, morally, but legally must, make decisions consistent with their children's best interest. Having said that, however, parental autonomy does exist, and I would suggest it consists in being the primary judge of what is or is not in their child's best interest and in having that judgment generally respected. So back to autonomy, uh, having established, I think, that it does exist in a certain sense in the paediatric setting. Properly understood, autonomy requires, but only requires, that all treatments be consented to. That, that all treatments require informed consent of the patient or parent. And historically, the rise of autonomy can be directly linked to the judicial development of the doctrine of informed consent. And then secondly, that the patient or the parent's preferences or goals should be incorporated to a certain extent in the decision-making process. Um, however, I want to suggest to you that in the futility debate, these ethical principles have been improperly inverted. Now it is claimed, so this is, I call this fulminant um, or, or pathological autonomy. Uh, in, in contemporary medical um, relationships, it is now claimed by patients uh, and by parents uh, that there is, in fact, an ethical obligation to offer treatment if it is requested or demanded. In other words, you must do it. Uh, and that it is unethical, because it is a disrespect for autonomy, to withdraw or withhold treatment without permission or, or without consent. It is argued that both quantitative and qualitative concepts of futility involve questions of value, and respect for autonomy requires that the parents' values reign. That it should be parents in the paediatric context who determine whether low odds of benefit justify or do not justify attempting treatment, and whether a particular effect will or will not count as a benefit. It is argued essentially that to withhold or withdraw treatments against the wishes of a parent violates the ethical obligation to respect their autonomy. And it's also argued, and I will address this point specifically, it is also argued that to withhold requested treatment is extremely problematic, is unethical, when without the treatment, the death of the patient is certain. So, for instance, by signing a no CPR order um, in circumstances where we have reason to believe that the patient will code. I want to suggest to you, however, that there is something profoundly wrong with that type of inversion or use, misuse of a perfectly laudable um, and acceptable um, ethical principle, namely the principle of autonomy. Arguments that insist that families alone can define therapeutic goals and benefits ignores a fundamental reality about the physician patient-parent-nurse relationship. What does it ignore? Well, it ignores two things. The first, um, I hope, is obvious. It ignores the moral agency of the healthcare provider themselves. The healthcare provider is not 
a technical automaton. The healthcare provider must not, and I would say cannot, none of us really can, and if we can, we should be concerned, none of us should leave our conscience at the threshold of the hospital. We must, we do, bring our conscience with us to work. If we did not bring it with us to work, there would be very few situations in which we could exercise our conscience since we spend most of our life at work. So, which is actually, but it's, it's really important. Our, our conscience isn't something for Sundays or, or, or Shabbat. Right? Um, so the first thing that this warped sense of autonomy denies implicitly is your my moral agency. But it also denies something else. It denies the moral nature of the profession of medicine itself. That medicine is and always has been a moral endeavor. Before it was a scientific endeavor, before it was a technological endeavor, it was, it is, it must remain. And it's in danger perhaps of losing the fact that it is a moral endeavor, and also that every single physician has an inescapable obligation to the moral goals of their profession. Their profession demands it of them. The physicians who have come before them for century and millennia before them demand of them dedication to the goals of their profession, to the moral goal of their profession. Uh, so again, just I want to really hammer this point home, and it's something I, I talk incessantly with our, um, our, our, our medical students with when I have the opportunity, the concept of the goals of medicine. Medicine is not a value-neutral activity. Medicine has definite goals, and those goals are moral goals, and they are moral goals because they seek, because medicine seeks to attain one of the most basic human goods of all, the good of health or in clinical medicine, the good of restored health. Medicine's ultimate goal is the noble goal, the moral goal of healing. Uh -huh. The goals of medicine define good medical practice. In other words, how medical knowledge and skill must be used. They can be used for other purposes. But in fact, to be medical, that knowledge and skills have to be put to the purpose of attaining the goal of medicine. Similarly, the goals of medicine delineate the limits of good medical practice, namely how medical knowledge and skill should not be used. And as I've said, and I would really love to have a presentation where I can develop this final point, the ultimate goal of medicine is healing. And that, that's why I've, I often suggest when physicians, as they often do, come to me, it's, it, it's quite common for um, physicians to ask me, what do I think about the plight of the, the patient in the bed? This is not something that actually I am primarily asked of by nurses. I think there's often a, a misperception that only nurses are, are concerned about futility um, and that we are consulted primarily or only by nurses. That isn't true. Most of the people that come to me about futility are physicians. And what I tell them is that it is not my job to answer that question. Uh, never allow any ethicist, this one or any other, to tell you that the, the, the care of your patient has wandered into the territory of being futile. That's not our job. Uh, but it is the physician's job. And I suggest to any doctor, when they are concerned about that, that when there is a quiet moment, when there is no one else there, they go to the patient's bedside in the quiet of the morning, although in the hospital the mornings are never quiet, um, maybe in the quiet of the evening, um, when all their other work is done, they go into their patient's room uh, and they look down on their patient or they sit with their patient's hand in theirs and hand on other hand on heart, they ask themselves one question and one question only, but they must answer it honestly to themselves. Um, the only thing that can ever really accuse us is our own conscience. 
they must ask themselves, is what I am doing, can I honestly say to myself, is what I am doing a healing act? If the answer to that is no, then we know that the goal of medicine is not being pursued and that this rupture, this moral rupture between what the physician is doing and what the, the profession is dedicated to doing, that it exists. Um, so what I want to suggest, just some suggestions now, I think there is a need to cultivate an ethic of mutual respect for autonomy. The autonomies both of patients and their families, but also the autonomy, the professional autonomy of the physician. A patient or their surrogate, their parent in this case, should and can only require from their physician actions which are consistent with the goals of medicine. Values to which, and this is also a really important point, values to which physicians have traditionally been committed to by way of an oath. Your profession, I think, other than um, the priesthood or the religious life, the monastic life, your profession is one of the few professions in which an oath or something like an oath is required, which tells us that there is something semi or qua not semi, quasi sacred about medicine, that it, is, that it is dedicated to one of the highest goods to which a human being can attain. Um, so the other point, that this point that I want to make here, the fi that this final point on the slide, where a decision is made to withhold requested treatment, it seems to me, instead of, which I sometimes hear, instead of criticizing um, or, or implicitly accusing of families or our parents of, of desiring that which is unworthy of them or unethical, uh, in, instead of essentially attacking or questioning the moral integrity of others, when we say no to that, we say no to it based on our dedication to our own values. This is not a judgment on someone else's values that they should ask for this. Rather, it is, and it only is, a commitment to our own values or as physicians, nurses, to the values of medicine. Uh, and in my experience, when these discussions are framed in that way, the decision not to provide treatment is often accepted. When we spend time, but it does, it does require spending time, when we spend time to explain in a manner in which our patients and families will understand that our profession is a moral endeavour, they understand, they understand that there are certain things we may not, we should not do. And like most reasonable people, they do not require of us to do that which would violate our conscience. It's not clear to me, however, that all of us do spend the time to explain the moral nature of what we are committed to. Therefore, they cannot often be blamed for requesting or requiring of us things which violate that oath. Um, so the next question would be, okay, so what does the goal of medicine, actually, or the goals of medicine, do they impose on physicians something as strong as a duty not to treat in certain circumstances? Well, there are, there are three possible, or is there a duty and how strong is the duty? Well, there are, there are three possible takes here. Um, you've got what I call the weak ethical stance, which essentially means that physicians should be permitted to refrain from offering futile treatments. You've got the moderate ethical stance. Physicians should be encouraged to refrain from offering futile treatment. And then you have what I would term the strong ethical stance. Physicians should be required or 
should require of themselves to refrain, to always refrain from offering futile treatment. And I, I happen to think that the argument for withholding futile treatment based on the goals of medicine favours that final stance, the strong stance that futile treatments, it's not just that they need not be offered, they should not be offered. Actions which do not pursue the goals of medicine are not authentic medical acts, even when they are informed by the very best of medical knowledge and medical skill. And I think there is an, an important consequence of adopting the stronger stance. If we adopt the weaker stance, doctors needn't provide futile treatment, but they can if they want, then the act of withholding or providing becomes an act of physician power. It's within the doctor's power to do it, but he doesn't have to do it if he chooses not to. And we see that in the hospital. We, we see some physicians are actually very convicted about not providing futile treatment. And we can find in another bed, in the next bed, someone in a worse state of health, sorry, a worse state, uh, who, who is being provided even more aggressive treatment. We can see the operation of power there. Um, one family gets what they want, another family doesn't, is dependent on the physician. The stronger stance actually, I think, witnesses to something much more genuinely powerful, which is a basic equality between the physician and the patient. And it is the, the equality of both being dedicated to and, in a sense, bound by, inescapably bound by the moral commitments that physician took on the day they took their oath. So it's not an exercise of power. In fact, it, as sometimes our families perceive it, the doctor will not provide this, this is unfair. It is not an exercise of power to say no. It is actually an exercise of humility to say no. Um, and in a certain sense of the weakness, although it's not weakness, but of the, the powerlessness which comes from the commitment to the noble ideal sworn to the day the oath was taken. Um, I want to look at this, the, the final question here. Um, I think I've got another 30 slides after this, which I definitely will not be able to fit in, even with a very rapid Glaswegian accent um, in the next 10 minutes. Um, I want to look at this question here um, of the relationship between, we've been talking about the goals of medicine, the relationship between medicine and death. And I want to quote Hippocrates. This, that the idea of futility is not something which has arisen only in the age of technology. Ancient and great physicians were aware of this problem too. And they came up with what I think was the right answer 3,000 years ago. Um, Hippocrates in the art. First, I will define what I conceive medicine to be. In general terms, it is to do away with the suffering of the sick, to lessen the violence of their diseases, and, because, of course, it is about taking away suffering and not being an accomplice to violence, and to refuse to treat those who are overmastered by their diseases, realising that in such cases, realising what? Realising medicine is powerless. So a frequent argument against withdrawing or withholding life-sustaining treatment contrary to the patient's wishes is that it will result in the patient's death. In fact, that argument, I think, is wrong. Ultimately, it's the patient's disease which will actually cause their death. But behind the argument, I think, lies a more profound assertion about the relationship between the goals of medicine and death. Namely, that the death of our patients in some sense represents the failure of medicine. Uh, and that the prolongation of life in and of itself, namely the prevention of death at any 
all costs, the cost, of course, being borne by the patient, is in itself a goal of medicine. Now, that is wrong. That, that has never, ever, ever been the goal of medicine. Um, even although, slowly but surely, um, and sadly, because of the tyranny of technology, it may be becoming such, maybe slipping into that, perhaps unreflectedly. In fact, the goals of medicine in respect to death are, one, the avoidance of a premature death, uh, but, and very importantly, the pursuit of a peaceful death. That actually has always been um, a goal of medicine. And, in, when, and when death is inevitable, it is the only pure and true goal of medicine, and a goal which the doctor is remiss, profoundly remiss, if they do not attempt to pursue it. Um, it seems to me the provision of life-sustaining treatment in end-stage patients is simply not consistent with the goals of medicine. It's a betrayal of medicine. And the provision, and I, I, I really do have to say this, the provision of life-sustaining treatment, in particular CPR, in the very last moments of a human being's life, when the doctor knows they will die, that they must die. To do that is profoundly antipathetic. Profound, it is a rejection of medicine. Uh, it, it is antipathetic to everything it stands for and has stood for. So the provision of life-sustaining treatment in end-stage patients, very important point, I think, it does something which is it's mind-blowing in a sense. It actually potentiates the disease. It feeds, if you like, it feeds the, the conceit of the disease. It allows the disease to be even more powerful than it would have been if nature had taken its course. It allows the disease to take a grip on the patient and essentially, I suppose, to throttle the life out of the patient in a way that would not have happened if there were no doctors around the patient and the patient was to die alone without the support of doctors, but naturally. So the provision of life-sustaining treatment in end-stage patients, as I say, potentiates the disease. That's why it's the antithesis of medicine. Uh, it prolongs suffering and dying. But in addition to, pro we often talk about merely prolonging, but it does something more. It intensifies suffering and dying. It's not just a matter of time. It makes the degree of suffering, the type of suffering, worse. It distracts from palliation, which is our obligation to the dying, and it offers false hope. Medical care should be provided in ways that enhance rather than threaten the possibility of a peaceful death. The chance of having a peaceful death should not be diminished because you have a physician. It should be increased. Thank you.